Mastermind Agent is proud to present success calls. Top real estate agents from across North America reveal their success secrets, strategies, and systems in up-close and personal interviews. You can find all the calls at www.mastermindagent.com. Hi, I'm Mike Cerrone with Mastermind Agent. This month's top agent is Phil Herman with Remax in Dayton, Ohio. Welcome to the call, Phil. Uh, it's really good to be here, Mike. Hey, I've been looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to a little technology chat with you. <laughs> this is the first time Phil's got on one of these things. I think he's doing awesome, and I can't wait to hear all the wonderful information he has to share. So let's go ahead and dive in. The first question I have for you, Phil, is this. Uh, instead of talking about what you're doing today, I know it's a while back, but let's go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, could you tell us uh, what did you do before you got into real estate? Well, let's see. Growing up, I was an athlete, um, and uh, the only way I was going to go to college was on my athletic skills, abilities, gifts, and talents, and I knew that. Um, I was from a family that couldn't afford to send six kids to college on a mailman's income. So uh, I put a lot of my life energy into pursuing my athletics, and I'm glad I did because the athletics has been kind of the foundation and the basics for any kind of success that I've had in the business world. I mean, in athletics, it teaches you how to win, how to lose, how to compete, how to get up and brush yourself off, get back in the game. You know, all those old sayings, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Winners never quit. Quinners <clears throat> never win. And those were great life lessons. But out of high school, and though I'm only 35 years old, Mike, uh, <laughs> Back in 1971, when I graduated high school, I was drafted. On December 19th, on my 19th birthday, my draft number was 19, not my number. So I was a victim of marketing and advertising. The Marine Corps said they were looking for a few good men. So I went in the Marine Corps, and that took me out of my sport. I, was, I did a lot of sports, football, baseball, basketball, track, wrestling, martial arts. But wrestling was my sport. My senior year, I won 32 matches in a row. I was undefeated on the state. Um, and I wanted to go to a powerful college to wrestle. I was going, at that time, I was going to college to wrestle, not for the education and girls. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I was drafted. I came out of the military. Um, uh, and then I was a walk-on at Ohio University. They were seventh in the nation that year in wrestling. That's why I went there. But as it turns out, it was a very Norman Walk Rockwell, charming college, beautiful setting. And um, I was funding my own way through school because as a walk-on, they'd already given out the scholarship. So I made the team as a walk-on. They paid for my books, which was very little. And so I was funding it myself. I'd saved up a little bit of money, but now I'm in my early 20s out of the Marine Corps. I really didn't have that much. So uh, on a weekend, I went home, took the civil service test. I scored 100 on the written civil service test. I said, excuse me, you got my score confused with somebody else. I'm not that smart. <laughs> Give me five bonus points for being in the military and said, you've got a job. And I said, well, I'd like for you to hold the job. You know, I'm, I'm in college. And they said, look, you either take the job or we'll give it to somebody else. I looked in my balance and my checking account. I took the job. So I worked for the government for about five years, was renting a home from a guy named Pat McAllister, who was a jack of all trades. He was an MAI appraiser. That's the highest appraisal designation that you can get. He was a finance major, a builder, developer. He built houses. And it merged into him building hotels. And one day sitting in his office, he said, Phil, I really think you ought to get your real estate license. So he was kind of the spark that lit the fire to me to get into the real estate industry. When he said, I think you ought to get into real estate, I was like, who, me? <laughs> you know, who are you talking to here? And, but, you know, he was without question the spark that lit the fire. I got in the real estate industry. This goes back a ways. And like in those days, here's your desk, here's your phone. Good luck. Isn't that the way it was, Mike, for us? Oh, way yeah. Absolutely. Then, a long time ago. So uh, in 1978, 
the CRS program was launched, Certified Residential Specialist Program. So I was not being trained in the company that I was, so I engaged in those programs. I was one of the early classes of the CRS program to get a CRS designation. And then um, that's what led me into the real estate. And, you know, and if you, you know, if you want to know what, you know, drives me today, well, two things. Number one, I grew up poor. I don't want to be there again. And number two, I'm just flat out very competitive. I mean, it's, it was, the, it's that, it's in my DNA. It was that athletic background that, you know, brings out that competitive drive and spirit. And you're not going to talk to too many people that have been doing something 41 years like I have and say, geez, you know what? It's only now that I think I can get really good at this. I've had my head handed to me so many times. I'm beginning to, win, to learn when to duck. So <laughs> I'm, I'm more enthusiastic and more passionate about it today than ever before. And, you know, as long as I have that childlike excitement and enthusiasm, I'm going to continue to do this. If I ever lose that, yes, that you get when you get a listing or put it in successfully and negotiate a deal, then I need to be doing something else. But I still get it today, including this morning. I put a deal together. Yes, it's there. <laughs> you know, so it's important for us to, you know, I think bring in that playful, childlike fun and enthusiasm into our work and be connected with it and present with it all the time. It's a good thing. First, a quick word from our sponsor, Real GTV, real estate agent lead generation television. Need more referrals? Get a free script and simple three part plan used by a top agent to receive and close 74 referral transactions in one year. Just go to freereferralscript.com. That's freereferralscript.com. Now, back to the show. Well, Phil, this is really interesting to me. It sounds like you've been a, uh, you look really fit. That's what I'm thinking. And, and of course, I haven't seen your whole body, but you look pretty fit to me. Are you still an athlete? <laughs> Are you still working out every day and everything? I'm still, well, I've been, I started lifting weights when I was 13 years old. At the age of 13, I was a junior national champion in weightlifting. I'm not a big stature. Uh, once upon a time ago, I was six foot tall. Today, I'm 5'11 if I put tall heels on. <laughs> I weigh about 150, 155. So, you know, I'm very cognizant of what I eat. Um, I've been a little lax on the training here lately, but from the age of 13 to last year, there was not a time that I was away from training six months at one time. And I took a 12 month break and launching it again. So, eating well, training, working out, you know, trying to keep your emotions between the lines, trying not to let you know, sweat the small stuff and realizing that most things are small stuff. The big stuff is you're born. The big stuff is that you die and everything in between is small stuff. <laughs> right. Well, Phil, let me, let me ask you this now. I know we're going back a ways. You've been in the business a long time. First of all, how long have you been in the business? Let's get that out there. I was licensed in 1977. 1977. Wow, I can't even add this. Uh, 42 years? Right around 42 years. 42 years. That's like I said, happen. God willing, God willing, I'll do it another 30 years. <laughs> I have no desire to retire, none whatsoever. My father uh, retired at the age of 55 and died at 65. So for me, retirement is telling your body you no longer need it and it prepares itself to die. I don't want to die. I want to live. Right. And, you know, so I want to stay relevant. I want to stay engaged. I want to be a contribution. And, you know, the way I work today is completely different than how I worked way back in 1977 or 78 or the 80s or the 90s. You know, you, you change and you grow as market shifts change and grow and what is important to you in life, you know, begin taking the lead and directing what you really want to do. We're about to go into some of the amazing things that you've done over your career, but I do want to go back to those early years because there are people listening who are getting their first year, just getting started, or even thinking about getting in the business. And for those folks, I'm going to ask this question. When you had your, that first year, did you have a fast start or a slow start? What happened that first year? 
I was licensed in October 27, 1977. I didn't have my first closing until February of 1978. So for five months, I was questioning whether I was suited to this industry or not. Back in that day, Camaros and Firebirds were selling really well. So I was buying Camaros and Firebirds to fix them up and sell them to pay back the people that I was borrowing money from, maxing out my charge cards. I mean, I was begging, borrowing, stealing money. I need to eat. And um, so, yeah, it was very challenging for me when I first got in. You know, again, the training was there's your desk, there's your phone. I mean, what you're doing for the real estate industry, Mike, is just so admirable and so inspirational because you're accelerating the growth. Whether you're a new agent or whether you're a superstar, you're accelerating the, rating the growth across the lines of real estate industries all across, all across America. And I really appreciate that. So I didn't want to comment on that. Oh, thank you but so yeah, much, when I, Bill. when I started, my, it was very slow. Five months, no money coming in. And I was wondering, you know, am I going to make it in this? And boom. I did a deal, and then another, and then another. Fast forward, I'm approaching 8,000 transactions and a billion dollars in sales. So, there you have it. So, if someone's struggling, just stick with it. What was this turning point for you? Why did it go from a dry spell for five months and then stuff started clicking? What changed? Well, actually, you know, I was planting seeds all along. The harvest wasn't coming up. Um, early on, I decided, you know, there's... 3,000 agents running around here in this Cincinnati Dayton marketplace. Um, how am I going to get anybody to do, want to do business with me? So I read a book by Al Rees and Jack Trout called Positioning. Are you familiar with the book? Oh, yeah. Yeah, great right. authors. In that book, there's a chapter in there that talks about positioning. The being number one in a category has power. As an example, if I say to you, Mike, when I mentioned toothpaste, what two brands come to mind? Crest and Colgate. There you go. Crest and Colgate. They have brand awareness in the mind of the consumer in their category, toothpaste. Now, it may not be the best toothpaste for our teeth, but they've got that brand marketing awareness and that position in the marketplace for that category. Well, so early on, this is going way back to 1978, I decided... I wanted to own the number one position in the mind of the consumer in the category called real estate in the Dayton Cincinnati market. And so that's what I set out to do. Where a lot of real estate agents today, Mike, I think in their mind, they're, they're in the real estate business and they happen or have to do a little bit of marketing. For me, I've been in the marketing business all along and I happen to do real estate. So I see it completely different. I don't, nothing gets me more excited than talking about marketing, which essentially is reverse prospecting where people are calling me up and asking me to do business. Now, certainly with that, I do a lot of high impact prospecting where I'm calling expireds and for sale by owners and, you know, I'm reaching out to the public and asking them to do business with me. Uh, but I think they're hand in glove. I think hand, high impact marketing Getting on the phone, door knocking, open houses, that's high impact marketing uh, the, or high impact uh, prospecting. The marketing, they're hand in glove. I want people to know who I am when I call them. I'm going to be much more successful in a conversion rate if when I pick up the phone and I call them and I say, hi, this is Phil Herman. And they go, oh, we know who you are. Boom. You're already relational. Then it's all, because what I believe, Mike, I believe that people want, they have to be able to trust you. If they don't trust you, they're not going to do business with you. They have to know you can get the job done. If, you can, if they don't believe you can get the job done, they're not going to hire you. And they have to like you. There ha it has to be relational. If they don't like you and it's not relational, they're not going to do business with you. Those three things to me have to be in play all the time. They've got to know you can get the job done. They've got to trust you and they've got to like you. You've got to be relational. You've got to speak to their listening and, and, and get to their level and connect with them. 
and do it generally, authentically, with sincerity, with heart. This is really good. This is uh, very interesting. You mentioned two concepts, two ideas of ways that people could get more business. Uh, one is to go out there and prospect, look for it, hunt for it. And the other is marketing where you're drawing them to you. It looks like you're doing both. Uh, in those early days, I'm going to assume that you were doing more hunting because the cost almost zero, right? You didn't have a lot of funds. And then you eventually developed into the marketing side of your business. Would you agree with that? Yes. I mean, in those early days, I picked a subdivision. We had a snowstorm in Dayton, Ohio in 1978, three feet of snow. People were gathering in the conference room and they're eating donuts and telling jokes and reading the newspaper. And I'm like, you know, I'm hungry. So I got in my car. I went out and I door knocked the subdivision in the snow. <laughs> I listed five properties, sold five properties out door knocking in four feet of snow. And at the age of, I was 24 when I started taking my real estate classes. I was 25 when I got my license, but I looked like I was 16. I mean, I didn't have a hair on my chest or a whisker in my face. I mean, I just was a young looking puppy dog. And I remember going to one particular door, knocking on the door, the guy opens the door and he goes, really? You're gonna tell me what to do with my single greatest investment? I've got a 16 year old son here, as old as you. <laughs> and now, back then, right then and there, I knew, Mike, I needed to know this industry. I needed to know what to say. I needed to learn scripts and dialogues. I needed to be deep in the scripts and dialogues. That I, if there was an objection, I wanted to be five or six deep on every objection that I was going to have to let my intellect lead the way for me. And in, in those early years as this young 16 year old, I guess, looking puppy dog knocking on the door and asking people to put their single greatest investment into my hands. So I really studied this industry and I still do. I still do. And it's, it, you know, it's, learning what not only what to say the scripts and dialogues it's how to deliver it's how to deliver the message is equally critical and important timing rate pitch tone modulation they all matter they make a difference let's let's dive into that a little bit if somebody was listening right now and they had to put together a couple transactions in the next 60 days so they could pay their bills get uh, out of a slump let's say where would you tell them to go? What would you recommend they do? I assume it's going to be prospecting. Who should they prospect and what approach should they take? Well, I mean, if you've got a large sphere of influence, but you don't have a past client database, I'd be calling people that know me and like me, and I would be asking them to help me. Who do they, I, this would be my script. Who do you know that's thinking about buying any residential or commercial real estate? Do any of your friends, business associates, relatives, acquaintance come to mind? I would prompt them that I really need your help. And, uh, you know, I remember when I was brand new on my first listing appointment, Mike, and the gentleman saying to me, why should I hire you? How many homes have you sold in my neighborhood? I'll never forget that. It was my first listing appointment. You never forget your first one. Nor do you forget the first contract that you wrote. The first contract that I wrote, I filled in a blank. I, I, I had him sign a blank contract and said, I'll get you the house. Nobody showed me how to fill in a purchase contract. <laughs> Whatever. That goes back a ways. But on my first listing appointment, I'll never forget the guy, the gentleman saying to me, Phil, how many homes have you sold in my, on my street? You know, very stern. And I said, well, not only have I never sold any on your street, I've never sold any in your subdivision. I've never sold any in your city or your county. I've never sold any in the state of Ohio. As a matter of fact, I've never sold a house. But I've never been average at anything in my life ever until somebody gives me a chance. Who knows what I might be, might be able to accomplish and do. And he said, I'm hiring you. Boom. You know, so if you don't have the track record, then you speak from the heart and you speak authentically, genuinely, and, and you reach out and try to connect in a relational, emotional way. Uh, if you're a new agent and you don't have a resume behind you, then 
leverage off of your franchise statistics or off your company statistics or off your office statistics. But nothing is going to communicate more powerfully than the heart, than relationship. Um, my listing presentation today is a 15-second elevator commercial. Now, I used to spend two hours on every listing appointment. I had the same flip charts that everybody else does, and I went over my brag book and listed all of these things that I was going to do for people to get their property sold. And, you know, at some point in time in my career, Mike, I felt very authentic, unauthentic doing it. I, it was just, it was not authenticity for me. That the reason properties sell, it's price. That's the truth of the matter. You can't find enough money to spend marketing and advertising a property to get it sell if it's not priced to where the buyers are. And for me to say that I'm going to do a brochure, or I'm going to do a brochure box, or I'm going to do a video tour, or I'm going to do this and that on social media, and I know it's not priced where the buyers are, it didn't feel good. So I, sh I got rid of my 48-page presentation flip chart book that you can put on a laptop, and I just started establishing my position in my 15 second elevator commercial, I do it on a listing appointment. I do it if I call an expired or for sale by owner today. And I let that lead the way and then I'm all about relationship. At that point, I'm all about asking questions, not making statements. When you're asking the questions, you're in control. And, and you show up powerful when you're asking questions. You show up as an expert. You show up that you care, that you're interested, that you want to help them. That's relational. Now, my, you want to hear my 15-second I do. I, I'm, I was just going to ask you, what is the 15-second 15 uh, 15 presentation? I knew you were going to, <laughs> and it's free. That's the best part of it. So it goes something like this, Mike. I'd say, Mike, it, let's just say I'm on a for sale by owner call with you. Or role play, it's fun. Okay. So okay. Um, I'd say, Mike, you know, we haven't met, but just look, let me give you my 15 second elevator commercial. I own the company. I've been in the real estate industry for over 40 years. Individually, I've sold about, well, I'm approaching 8,000 transaction in an industry where the average agent only sells about six properties a year. I've outsold a field. Of, so approaching 8,000 families helped Mike as a bundle, given again that the average agent only does about six a year. I've outsold a field of 3,000 agents 27 years straight. It ended up ranking me in the top 100 in the United States of America by Realtor Magazine three years in a row out of a million real estate agents. September a year ago, I wrote a book on real estate. As it turns out, it's the number one international bestseller on Amazon.com. The only reason I tell you that, Mike, so you know I'm not new, I'm not part-time, and I can probably help get your property sold hopefully for the most amount of money in a reasonable amount of time with the fewest problems possible. And I'm sure that's what you'd want. That Here's to me, Mike, the key. It's very difficult for all of us to talk about our credentials because it's difficult to not show up like we're bragging that we're arrogant. I address that. I say, I say these things not because I'm arrogant, cocky, or conceited. It's because I'm confident. And there's a big difference. I'm very good in the real estate industry. I'm very good in marketing. People seek me out for my marketing skills. And I can help you too. I've helped almost 8,000 families just like you get their property sold. And so I really want your business. I really want this opportunity. Well, let's break that down. Because I, I, I can just hear... Some people, their thoughts, they're listening to you and they're going, yeah, but I never sold 8,000 homes. How do I use Phil's script? I don't know what to do here. Maybe your franchise has sold 20,000. Maybe, you know, maybe your office has sold 20,000. Um, you then leverage off what you have available to you, even if you're new. If you're new, you're with a broker. And if you're with a broker, you're with a company and there's some sales behind there. Maybe your broker over the course of his career has sold 500 homes, then shifted from I to we. We have sold in our office 500 homes over the years. So you just shift from I because you don't have much of an I just yet. You're new. You're trying to get it going. So 
shift a weed. You've got a team. I've worked with the team since 1978 before the word team was even uttered in this real estate industry. And I've had to, I've rebuilt 15 teams over my career. So whether you're new or you're a veteran agent, you're a part of some team. So just shift. You're a team. Shift. Use what's available to you. It's not ag anymore if you're brand new and you don't have a lot of transactions behind your wings just yet. I, I used, and that's what I did. I used and leveraged my, my company. I said, we have done a thousand transactions over the past 12 months. Does that help? It does. And it would work for someone even if they're not brand new. Maybe they've been uh, floating along for a couple of years or part time or things haven't worked out in the last year. They could still tap into the stats of their team or their uh, company, uh, their franchise. Uh, you could even say in the MLS, X number of homes have sold. They could tap into something there. I really want to go back to one thing you said in the very beginning when you were just starting out, though. You said you used honesty and you showed how enthusiastic you were to get their home sold. And I think that cuts through a lot for people that you're, when you're straight with them. And I could just, I, could, I felt like I was the seller sitting there listening to you when you're just getting started and I wanted to hire you. Uh, I think yes. that's beautiful. I, I, you know, communicating from the heart, there's nothing more powerful than communicating from the heart and relational and for it to be authentic and real and clean and true. You've got to get, I think we have to get clear about who we are. We're out here to help people. We're in the service business. The public doesn't know what we know about real estate. They're unconscious incompetence. They don't know what they don't know, but we do. And, you know, we can lift them up or we can, we can, we can tear them down. It's in our hands. And, you know, you'll never, ever regret taking the high road in your business practice or in life. You'll never regret taking the high road. You will only regret not taking the high road, no matter what it is that you're doing. Getting back to your listing presentation, because I think it's really cool that you were opening that up. You said you had that 15 second or so intro. Then you got to the heart of it, right? You said, how are we going to get your home sold? for the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time with the fewest hassles. And you dove into their particular situation and you said you do a question based presentation. What type of questions do you want to ask? What are you asking in that presentation? Well, I'll do it with you. I'll, I'll do it with you. I'll say Mike. So why are you selling the property? Are you staying local or are you moving out of the area? What were your plans? Yeah, we're staying local. We want to downsize. Uh, you want to downsize. So do you need to sell this home in order to sell another home? Uh, yeah, we, we probably need the, the money out of this home to get the next one. Okay, well, that's true for 99% of the people. Most people need to sell to buy. Side note, I don't want them to feel bad. that They need to sell in order to buy. I want to keep a connection going. I want it to be relational. So I come back and say, well, that's true for 99% of us. Most of us need to sell in order to buy. So all these for sale signs you see out there, we're all in the same boat. We're trying to get a buyer on our house before we go find our piece of the American dream. So have you been pre-approved for your financing? So once your home does sell, you're ready to go? No, I haven't talked to a lender yet, no. Okay, well, I'll help you with that. Um, so uh, uh, what do you think your property is going to sell for, Mike? Uh, I really don't know. That's kind of why we brought you in. Okay, well, if you did know, what do you think it might sell for? You know, the, the folks down the street, they have a similar house, and they just sold for five fifty, dollars so maybe something around that. Okay, pause. You told me you didn't know. That's the typical response. But just a little bit of script, a little bit of language, and I know you don't know, but if you did know, what do you think it might sell for? And then you came back with five fifty. dollars so I know about where you're thinking, don't I? Isn't that nice to know? when you're right in the beginning of an interview on the most critical part now, hiring me and pricing. Okay, so I'll continue on. I'll say, well, Mike, what's most important to you? For some people, it's speed of the sale. For others, it's squeezing every last dollar out of the marketplace. What's most important to you? Uh, you know, we don't have the, the new home figured out yet, so it's not a speed issue. I, we probably want the most money we could get so we could make that transition smoothly. I'm looking at retiring, and I want to make this a smooth transition. 
Good. So when would you like to see your property sell? Would you like to see it sell in the next two or three months? Doesn't matter if it takes six to 12 months as soon as possible. What would be your goal? Yeah, we're pretty flexible. Um, but I would like to get this all done before the, the school season starts up again in a couple months. So uh, I'd like to do that before I, my, my kids are getting established. They're off in college now. And, but I would like to get that set by then. I think it'd be a good timing before the, the winter hits. Okay, so uh, just kind of coming back to price for just a second, Mike, have you had an opportunity to have a third party professional independent real estate appraiser come out and appraise your property for its market value just yet? No, we haven't done that. Well, the only reason I ask that question, it's recommended now by the National Association of Realtors. We agree with it and we coordinate it. They recommend it for two reasons. Number one, so you can make sure you're not overpricing or underpricing your property, but also to make sure the realtors that we're not doing that to you. Second and most important reason you want it is that when you get an offer, you're probably going to get a lowball offer. All the buyers are lowballing all the sellers, the realtors are telling the buyers to lowball the sellers. The only thing that's help, helping me negotiate these prices up for my sellers are the independent appraisals. So whether you hire me or you hire any of the other thousands of agents that are running around, it's a critical step in the process. I can sell your property, Mike, without getting the independent appraisal done, but I'll look you in the eye and tell you it'll take me longer to sell it and it probably won't sell for as much money. So that independent appraisal is going to help me sell your property faster and for more money. Certainly, I don't want to see you underprice your property and leave any dollars on the table. But by the same token, I don't want to see you overprice it because if you do, all you're going to do is help sell the competition. You're going to become shop worn and you'll end up netting less money than had we gotten it professionally, independently appraised in the beginning and went into the market at the right price. So my whole goal for you, Mike, is to figure out what's the upper level that I can place you to where I can get buyers to make offers. And then we put our negotiating skills together and negotiate it up to the best price for you. And incidentally, on negotiation, Mike, I was trained at Harvard in a course of negotiation. So you got a pretty good player in your court to help you out <laughs> cool. negotiate. And haven't done, uh, haven't approaching 8,000 transactions and a billion dollars in sales, there's probably not going to be anything that will come up on your property that I haven't had to deal with maybe a thousand times before somewhere in my past. So you're in good hands. So, Excellent. Um, okay, so, so then, and, and, and let's just say, Mike, that in this dialogue here, because it's a critical part of the listing, that you're hesitating on the appraisal because you don't want to spend the $350. How, of the how much is that appraisal going to cost? Yeah, the appraisal is going to cost you $350 for a house this square feet in this price range. Depending uh, on the I don't know if I want to do that. I understand. But, you know, first of all, Mike, uh, when your offer comes in, if I can't get it up $350, the cost of the appraisal, I'll give it back to you at closing. That $350 is probably, appraisal is probably going to make you tens of thousands of dollars in the negotiating process. But secondly, if we don't get the appraisal done, Mike, and an offer comes in, I'm going to go to the buyer or to the buyer's realtor and say, I think it's a good deal. And that realtor or that buyer is going to say, oh, sure, you would say that, Phil, you represent the seller. So the buyer and the buyer's realtor don't care, Mike, what you think it's worth, and they don't care what I think it's worth. I'm representing you. But if I can take them an appraisal from a licensed top appraisal firm, appraiser in the area, that's going to carry a little bit more weight. And that is going to be the tool that when you get a lowball offer like everybody else does, you're probably not going to get an offer for over full price or at full price. It happens. Probably not. Not in our marketplace right now. Um, it's the tool that's going to help me negotiate a better value and a better price for you and your family. And I know that's what you want. You want as much as you can possibly get. So I'm asking you to give me a tool to help you get the most amount of money for yourself and your family. It's very important. And you know what, Mike, you, you can pay them either by check, cash, or credit card, however you want to pay them. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, Phil, are you telling me you're not going to give me a price today on my house? Well, Mike, um, this first appointment is, gives me an opportunity to meet you, take a look at your property, see if I think I can help you, which I think I can. 
see if you feel comfortable with me enough to go to the next step. If you do, we order up the independent appraisal. We can go ahead and sign the listing based on a price you feel comfortable with today. We'll get the appraisal done. We can adjust, adjust your price up or down or leave it the same based on the appraisal when it comes back. So we can go ahead and enter into the marketplace. It's no more than a keystroke in the computer to adjust the price if need be. But we need the appraisal for when the offer comes in so we can negotiate it up to the best price for you and your family. Does that make sense? It does. Okay, so let's pull out of the role play. So that was really sure. interesting. So you're really pushing for that pre-appraisal because as you mentioned in the beginning, you know that the price is what's going to sell this home and getting that price right is the key. I like how you mentioned you would list the property at whatever price they want to put on it today. You'd actually write in the number and then you can make a quick adjustment with a keystroke, right? That's, that was a really good word or term. You have great language, by the way. I hope everybody's listening to the dialogue. And um, uh, so that was a great way to uh, approach the problem of, do you leave the contract blank then and you come in later with the price? No, we fill in the price because I want you to sign the listing with me. So we go ahead and sign the listing, but I'm going to go ahead and get your property appraised and then we'll adjust the price up or down when the appraisal comes back. You're in total control, Mike. Now, does that- but When the that appraisal comes back, Mike, and it's not where you are on your price, at that point, you're going to have to get a little more realistic. Maybe we'll have to have another discussion because you might go, oh, geez, I, I thought it was worth a whole lot more, Phil. And I say, darn market. I thought it was a whole lot more too. That market out there, there are such bad guys. I'm the good guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm the good guy. You know, the, it's not the appraiser's the bad guy. It's the market that's a bad guy. The appraiser's just given us a snapshot picture where the value is on your house today. This is what a buyer should be willing to pay for. On, on your uh, approach to listings, you do a pre-appraisal uh, then. Do you also do a pre-inspection or pre-title or anything else? I don't do pre-title and I don't do pre-inspection. I, 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 I would rather negotiate out the inspections than... Because if that inspection come, report comes in, once they get a contract, aren't we all excited once we get a contract? Aren't we all kind of visually moving ourselves out of our home into our new palace that, you know, our hope is going to be achieved and fulfilled? It's, you know, so I would rather deal with the inspections when I get the inspection report back. No two inspectors' inspection reports are the same. And so, you know, Let's see what that inspection is when it comes in. Now, if I see something blatant, I'm going to mention it. If your roof is leaking, you're going to hear from me. If the light if don't come on when I flip the switches, you're going to hear from me. If there's a plumbing issue, if you're, you know, there's some fundamental staging things that I'm going to review. And, you know, maybe some of the deferred maintenance or uh, deferred capital improvement things that need to be done. I'm going to mention those. Just because I want you to prepare when the inspection report comes back, the buyer's going to ask you to do probably just about everything. If you don't do it, they might not buy your house. And I try to isolate the inspections, incidentally, to habitability issues. The minor routine maintenance and repair items that do not affect habitability are not to be included as a part of the contract or reason for cancellation of the contract. That the spirit of the inspections is habitability issues as defined by Webster's Dictionary. Is the property habitable because I'm seeing across the country because I coach real estate agents uh, a lot of fallout on contracts over inspections and I think one of the healthy ways to look at this is to have the spirit of the inspections to be about habitability issues I had on one of my inspections report the bushes need trimmed I'm like the bush are you really are you putting that in an inspection report the bushes need trimmed so you know, some of the inspections have gone a little bit too far and it needs to be brought back to habitability. To me, that's fair and reasonable. But minor routine maintenance and repair item comments that are not affecting habitability in my world should not be included in the, uh, in the inspections and should not be cause a reason to cancel a contract. And I think it's important that realtors start thinking this through and you know, and getting a meeting in the minds and communicating and educating both buyers and sellers that the spirit of the inspection should revolve around habitability because there, you're not going to go into a home that some inspector can't find some maintenance comments on. Um, so uh, 
that's just kind of a little side note. I don't know whether that came about. I'm random. I mean, my, my nickname from my son is random. His dad is random. <laughs> random. Well, Phil, let's, let's do this. No, it's uh, okay. I can list, sell, negotiate, and prospect. Train, hire, train, recruit, and retain, and lead a team. That's what I'm good at. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, Real GTV, real estate agent lead generation television where top agents reveal exactly how they create consistent flows of home buyer and home seller leads into their practices every month. Need more leads? Hit the pause button right now. Open Google and search RealG TV. That's R-E-A-L-G dot TV. Now, back to the show. You have a lot of skills in a lot of areas, as you just demonstrated. And what I want to do, though, is I don't want to miss out on one of your strongest skill sets, which you mentioned yourself, and that is marketing. So let's talk about marketing for a few minutes, uh, and I'd like to drill down into a couple. So one uh, that we were uh, that I know you have some expertise in, and that is expired listings. As markets start to slow down across the country, I think we're going to see more of those. What approach do you recommend somebody take with an expired listing, and what kind of approach do you take? Multiple, and you know, first of all, in the real estate industry. I really don't think you should focus on one thing. I think you should have many, many lines in the water. The typical real estate agents, they're going out on the dock with their fishing pole, a line on the end of that pole with a worm in the water trying to catch a fish. I suggest you go out on that same pond in a boat and you cast a net. So if, you know, the for sale by owners are not biting, maybe the expired are not biting. That's not biting, maybe the marketing is working. Is the telemarketing working? Is the door knocking working? Are the open houses working? What's working? Past clients, fear of influence. You know, you keep multiple lines in the water all the time because the market is going to forever change and shift. And so in terms of how to approach the real estate industry, uh, I believe that you open lots of channels and you get lots of lines in the water. If I'm going to go after expireds, which you just asked me on, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to call them. I'm going to mail them a marketing book that is amazing, that my competitors are not going to be able to compete with. The graphics in the marketing book are $30,000. So I'm going to mail a stellar marketing book that positions me in the mind of the consumer as being the top in the category called real estate, and I'm proving it. It's not a song and a dance, I'm proving it. So I'm gonna call them, I'm gonna mail to them, I'm gonna knock on your door. And then I'm gonna repeat, I'm gonna mail to you again, I'm gonna keep calling you. And you know, because it's a contact sport. If I don't make contact with you, Mike, I'm not gonna set an appointment. So a lot of agents think if they call for sale by owner and expired, they've done their job. No, 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 no. Until you talk to them, you're not there. It's until you set an, the purpose of the call is to set an appointment. If you come into the office in the morning and you have no appointments, you've got one job description in my world. You are to prospect eight or 10 hours a day so you can get face to face on an appointment. If you're not, I believe whether you're new or you're a veteran or you're a superstar agent, if you're not investing 20 to 25% of your day, into business development and prospecting, it's a mistake that, you know, you'll lose, over time you'll lose momentum. And it could even be momentum that you'll lose in terms of gross commission income or momentum that you'll lose in terms of enthusiasm for the industry and the business. It's about learning how to take the spikes out of the business and get a little bit more even. And there's nothing more important than we get up in the morning to look at our schedule. Are we on a face-to-face appointments? If we are not, we got to get real with ourselves. Then our day is about business developing and prospecting. And I consider marketing business developing and prospecting as well. So, because I believe they're handing love. And I don't remember what the question was that you asked me. (laughs) (laughs) You're doing a great job. You're talking about going after an expired listing if somebody was going to approach that. And I want to do a step back for a minute. You said that no matter what level of production you're at, you should be in prospecting to get appointments every day. 
and I just know a little bit of information here. I know that you have a mentor that you've been following and a coach for a long time here now, Bob Bolin, and he still prospects, as far as I know, last time I yes, talked. Yes, he does. And uh, he's at an extraordinary high level, so these people have to stay plugged in, right? Absolutely. I mean, Bob's been my mentor and my coach for over 20 years. I mean, that guy's called me at 9 o'clock in the morning for over 20 years, no matter where he was. He might be calling me from China. He might be calling me from Europe. He might be calling me from Australia. But he made that call to me every Monday morning at 9 o'clock, and I look forward to it. The single greatest tool that I think any agent can give them is what you're doing, Mike, to open themselves up to coaches and mentors. I like to coach real estate agents one-on-one. -on -one. The single greatest contribution that a coach has is accountability. We cannot hold ourselves accountable to the level that a coach can hold us accountable to. Let me give you just a little bit of an example of what I mean by coaching and accountability, because I think this is critically important, Mike, in the relationship that I've had with Bob. I mean, 22 years, he's taught me how to be a real estate coach, didn't he? Um, so uh, this would be a typical coaching session. Bob calls me up and he says, uh, he never called me Phil. I'm waiting for the day that he calls me Phil. <laughs> he called me up at, eight, at nine o'clock in the morning and said, Herman, he goes, um, I want you to get on a plane February 17th and fly back February 18th. Uh, you're going to change your listing presentation. And I went into my, now why do I want to go do something like that? I, you know, I've been leading this marketplace for 20 years. Why do I want to change my listing presentation? And then you see, he would just go, just get it done. So I flew up there and I watched him do a listing presentation. It was a question-based. Mine was a statement-based. So immediately I came back, changed my world, changed my world on listing presentations. Now, side note, I shadowed 40 of the top agents across the United States of America. It took me four years to do it. I looked at their business models, their operating systems, their marketing, how they did what they did. These were stellar. They're legends in the business today. And they're still doing great. Great agents are going to do great if they want to. Um, so uh, here's another coaching session. I, I, just want, I just want you to see the magnitude. Uh, he says, Phil, um, Herman, I want you to get your CCIM designation. I go, well, what's that? And he goes, well, Google it. I got to go. Goodbye. So I Google CCIM. I find out it's a commercial designation. It stands for Certified Commercial Investment Manager. There's of, of the... 125,000 real estate agents across the United States of America practicing commercial investment real estate, only about 6% have that CCIM designation. I'm one of those 6% now, but it's considered the PhD of commercial investment real estate, some of the best education I've ever exposed myself to, and it's made me 10 times a better residential agent as a result. So I do both commercial and residential now. As a result of tapping into that, and he told me it would. So the next Monday morning, he calls me up and says, you know, have you enrolled in the classes? And I said, you know, Bob, now why do I want to go get my commercial designation? I've led the residential market for over 20 years, you know, and he goes, well, because over the course of the balance of your career, number one, uh, you'll make an extra two or three or four or five million dollars in gross commission income and maybe a hell of a lot more. And he says, number two, it'll make you a better real estate agent, a business, better business person. So I went out and it, I look into that program, listeners. It is a rigorous, tough program. I went out and got my CCIM designation, and I'm very glad I did, and I recommend it to anybody. You will become a much more powerful business person and commercial uh, or residential real estate uh, broker with that commercial knowledge behind you. Here's another coaching call. He calls me up one day, and he says, Phil, he goes, I want you to buy a piece of land and, and develop it and build an office building up. Um, I do my whining and complaining. Now, why do I want to go do that? I don't know anything about developing or building or construction. And he says, well, because it'll make you a better businessman and you'll learn a whole heck of a lot more about what business is all about by doing that. So I did. I went out and I developed some land and built some buildings and their investment properties today. So 
you know, some of the tasks that Bob gave me, these were big things. Here's the last task he gave me. He says, Phil, I want you to go write a book. No, it's the second to the last thing. He says, Phil, I want you to go write a book. I go, well, I, I, I don't know anything about writing a book. He goes, well, just get it done. So I did. I wrote a book when I got done. It took me a year to write it. I read it. And it was awful. It was so bad. I threw it in the trash can. I was embarrassed. I sent it to Bob and he just called me up and he goes, Herman, this isn't going to get it. Do it again. And he goes, but this time, write it in your voice. So I did with Dennis LeBlanc, who has been in marketing with me for 27 years now. He's a co-author on my book. And he's a master wordsmith. He's a writer. He's a creative mind. He's been, he's been in real estate marketing for 27 years and has been my marketing agent. Still is, even today. I was on the phone with him a couple days ago. Uh, but I got it done. I got the book done. In my very last coaching session with Bob, he says, I'm going to retire out of coaching. And he says, so uh, I've spent 22 years, Herman, on the phone with you every Monday morning. He's, I've taught you how to be a real estate coach. You go out and launch a national real estate coaching consulting business, and you'll contribute to a whole lot of people. And always remember, you'll learn a whole lot more from the coaching students than they'll ever learn from you. And so I'm trying to get lift and do that on Mondays, but on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Fridays, and some of Saturday, I'm doing residential, commercial, real estate, investments, and brokerage in the Dayton, Cincinnati region. Dayton, Cincinnati, incidentally, Mike, is sort of like Dallas, Fort Worth, St. Paul, Minneapolis. It's a regional market. And it, it, it's a 50-minute drive for me to get to Cincinnati. And I, I suggest to agents, if you're, not, if you're not willing to drive at least an hour for a listing, widen your geography. I'll take it. I'll take that listing that you won't want to drive to for 50 minutes. If I can earn a commission, I'm going. I'm not lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Phil, that, that's amazing. I, I want to point out something I was thinking about when you were talking there about you and Bob. Bob coached you for over 20 years at once a week. That's over a thousand coaching calls you were on. I think you are now a master of coaching because you've been coached so well for so long by the best. I mean, it's amazing. Well, you know what? It's interesting that you say that, Mike, because I said in Bob's parting words to me, he said, Phil, everything I have taught you over 22 years, it's yours now. It's your copyright. It's yours. He goes, I learned it from somebody else, or I learned it from the School of Hard Knocks, or I learned it from Life Lessons, but I'm passing it on to you. So, you know, what I have to give to people, I feel like, Mike, I'm just really kind of a conduit to coach agents one-on-one. -on -one. I'm a conduit of information from my own business and life experiences. If I'm approaching 8,000 successful transactions, I guarantee you I have failed 8,000 times or maybe 10,000 times. And that's where I learn the most. And I've had some good uh, productivity things that have happened in my career. I mean, with myself and a small team and uh, a couple of handfuls of Remax agents, I tutored, or under my tutelage, we did a thousand transactions and a hundred million dollars in volume in twelve months. That's that was exciting. I, I remember thinking back that one month I did forty-seven transactions. This is myself, me and my little team. The very next month we did forty-three transactions, so we did ninety transactions in sixty days. It, <laughs> It was exciting to do that. And it, it takes a lot of life energy, a lot of focus. And we haven't talked about this much, but surrounding yourself with the right people and learning how to bring the right people in, it's everything. You want to build your team on integrity, attitude, performance, and service. Integrity goes without saying. You tell the truth. Follow the golden rule. Um, Attitude. Negativity is the single most inhibiting factor to success, unequivocally the single most inhibiting factor. If anybody comes into my organization or into my team with a negative attitude, they will not last, they'll want to leave. Because I want a positive environment. There's enough negativity going on all around us. We don't need to have that in my home away from home. This place has got to be fun somehow.
All right. So integrity, attitude, performance, everybody's got to be responsible perform, for performing into their own individual areas of responsibility. Using their skills, abilities, gifts, and talents. And, 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 and my role as a, as a leader, a mentor, a coach, and I'm just a player coach. That's all I am. I'm a player coach is to bring out the best in each and every one of them. I've got an assistant working with me right now. Her name is Elizabeth Flowers. She's extraordinary. She's a double degree in business and marketing, an extensive sales background, was in pharmaceutical sales, um, customer service, inside sales service, um, telemarketing uh, experience, smart, bright, driven, and You've got to have those kind of players around you. My operations person has been with me for 22 years. The same guy for 22 years, Brian Smith. I'm overwhelmed, you know, about the contribution that he makes. My bookkeeper has been with me for 22 years. You, if somebody can be around my personality for a month, <laughs> let alone 22 years, <laughs> you know, so... Learning how to interview and, and build a team. I've, had, I've rebuilt 15 teams. And some of the people that have come out of my teams, you interviewed a guy named Mike Wall. Mike Wall was my team as a buyer agent. And he's out there, you know, just doing magnificently. There's others that are out there doing magnificently that I've trained. Denise Swift, I've trained her, Herman Castro, who else? Um, Tim Hall. I mean, some of these people have gone on and made seven-figure incomes. I mean, what could be more rewarding than to see people that have come and exposed themselves to your training or your coaching go out and just do magnificent things? It's just, it's lovely. It's, there's so much reward in that. But finding the right people, learning how to conduct an interview, how to hire, understanding how to train, retain them, Make them feel good about themselves. Grow them. And you've got to understand, when you grow people, you're growing them to be the very best that they can be, and they're probably going to leave you. They're going to go do their own thing. So you don't hold back. You just you understand. There's more business out there than anybody could ever begin to handle. You've got to come from abundance. And you train your people that way. You train them to be better than you. And if you're doing that, you're doing the right things. You're going to get better yourself when you're training to do better than you. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I wanted to interject that. I, I don't know if you asked the question. But again, <laughs> my excuse is that I'm random. My nope, son, nope. Well. This is right up the, the alley of what I want to talk about. Uh, one of the questions I have for you is you have built 15 teams, rebuilt them over all these time. You know a lot about team building. And so you, you kept mentioning the interview, and I think what you're saying there is it's so important to get the right person, you know, on the right seat in the bus, right? But get the right person. You talk about this interview process. During that process, what are you asking? What are you looking for? Give us maybe the top three things that you're doing during that interview process. To make sure you don't get a dud. Make sure you get someone who's going to be someone that will fit in your culture and plug in and be productive. Well, first of all, I don't rely just on me. So I might conduct an interview one-on-one, -on -one, and then I might bring that same person back to interview in front of maybe me and two or three or four other people on my team, because certainly they're going to see things that I don't see. I might even walk out of the room, and I often do. And then I might look at each team player, say on a scale of one to 10, where is this person? And, you know, I'm only looking for eight, nines, and tens. You know, that, that's what I'm looking for. But i got to tell you what I'm looking for more than anything else, Mike. I'm looking for that eye of the tiger. I'm looking for drive. I'm looking for grit. And you give me somebody that has passion, drive, fire in their belly, eye of the tiger, grit. They want to do things for all the right reasons and that they want to play on a team that it's more important that the combined work ethic of the team will always surpass that of an individual acting on their own, always. And if they want to be on a magnificent team, and I don't want large teams anymore. I like small boutique teams to work with. 
Um, and, but, but I look for great players. I look for the best of the best. And what I'm looking at more than anything else is that heart, that drive. And then I want to know, what, what, why do you want to do it? I mean, fundamentally, it comes down to this, Mike. What do you want? When you get clarity on what it is that you want, oh, then you got to figure out why do you want it? And if you're not clear about why you want it, you're not going to have the grit, the drive, the desire, and the passion to go after it. And then you got to figure out how you're going to get it. What's the plan going to be? What is the plan? And then you got to be, you have, you have to have sensory acuity. You've got to measure to see if what you're doing, sensory acuity, to see if what you're doing is getting you what you want. And then have the, the flexibility in your own personality, in your own ego, that if it is not getting you what you want, that you're willing to change. Kaizen. Kaizen is a word. It means, kai means change, zen means good, change for good, or change for the good and better. I took a seminar in Tony Robbins' uh, mansion in La Jolla, California in 1988. This is before he became famous. We were in fold-up metal chairs in his living room. He taught the class in a t-shirt barefoot, a sleeveless t-shirt, barefoot, and shorts. This big giant of a 6'8 guy with hands that were five times as big as mine. And he walks out and he goes, hello, everybody. My name's Tony Robbins. And you were like, I, I, who is this guy? <laughs> and, you know, but I, you know, he introduced Kaizen to me in 1988. He kind of coined, can I? It's an acronym for constant and never-ending improvement. And, and I resonated that with that because that's what got me through my athletic careers. I was always playing up real estate agents. Get it? You want to shadow top agents. So in my athletics, I was always playing up. I never played against somebody who was as good as me. I wanted to go against people that were older, stronger, faster, smarter, more skilled. I wanted to raise my game. You'll do that in shadowing. And then, you know, so... You play up. And uh, so I took, oh, and then lastly, in that formula that I was talking about, sorry, I had to come back. I got lost. I do. So lastly, you, once you determine um, that you need to change for the good or better, you got to override all this with a coach and not just a coach, Mike. People got to, you know, keep getting the word out on mastermind. You know, these are, the tools that accelerate each agent's level of productivity, quality of lifestyle. Way back once, a ta ta once upon a time ago, I was in a mastermind group with Bob Bowen and Dr. Fred Gross, and I was the lowest producer in there by far and away, just so you know, by far and away. And these guys were geniuses. I like, I don't even know how I got in the group. I'm sitting around looking at them going, these are magnificent players. But I remember one day Fred said, to our whole group. He said, life is primary. Work funds life. Do dollar productive activity. Create a magnificent life. We're born to live like royalty. There's no honor in poverty. He said that one time and I instantaneously memorized that. That was decades ago. And I agree with him. You've got to keep a certain level of balance in what you're doing. That life is primary. I mean, take care of yourself exercise. I've been a vegetarian since 1978. You know, uh, you know that helps keep me thin. It, you know, fuel for the body. I, it takes a lot of energy to do what we do. You know, we're not digging ditches, but the mental strain that takes place up here, it affects our bodies too. You know, you know build your body and you will build your mind. Uh, read uplifting things. Read. Get on mastermind. Uh, read books, listen to tapes, podcasts. You know, there's so many opportunities today. But, you know, what you're doing, Mike, funneling this in to these kind of video opportunities and bringing in great agents as, as you do, it's, it's a magnificent contribution. So I, I just, I feel compelled to reach out to your listening audience and, you know, tell your comrades about this program. Uh, there's a lot in there for all of you. You know, create a team of people where you listen to these together and you brainstorm ideas that you hear because everybody's on a different pace. And you, you, know, you might hear something different than the guys or gals sitting beside you. Pull it together. 
take notes, have little weekly meetings or monthly sessions on these sessions, and grow yourself. You can do, be, and have anything you want. I mean, I did it. I'm fundamentally, I'm from a poor family of eight, six kids. You know, I so honor my deceased father. He was a hard worker. My mother that raised six kids. I always said if I could hire my mom to go to work for me, I could get some things done. I mean, she was one of these women that said, you got the, you're cutting the grass, you're doing the dishes, you're running the vacuum, and you, none of you are going out until you get your work done. And so if you want to go out in the park and play, get it done. She taught me about delegation, right? <laughs> Getting work done. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, Phil, uh, I, again, I, I want to come back to this idea of marketing and branding and so forth, because I know you're an expert in there, and I want to get a couple pieces Yes. Uh, there's a different concept in marketing, right? There's two ways to go. There's direct response marketing uh, versus image advertising and branding. Where do you fall in that spectrum? What do you think agents out there should be doing? Well, like business development and prospecting, you want lots of lines in the water. You want to be very deep, six deep on any objection that shows up in our industry. When you work a for sale by owner, you want to attack them in multiple ways, five ways. You, you, if you want to be a superstar, you got to do what the superstars are doing. You know, I've always said, you, you, somebody's probably not going to beat me out too often on resume. I, I mean, approaching 8,000 deals is a ton. Now, Bob outproduced me, you know, so I've always been like this with him. But I can learn from agents to do a whole lot less than me or a whole lot more than me. It doesn't matter. I'm always looking for the learning. Um, but if, if, you know, so in the area of marketing and advertising, you want to do it all. Brand, image, direct response. You don't want to leave anything uncovered. You want to thread a little bit of it in. To, you want to bring them together. You want to create a stronger thread by weaving, or a stronger rope by weaving these threads together. So you've got to pay attention to your brand. It is who you are. It's a... It's who you are. Your image is very important. Your positioning statement, your unique selling proposition. Look, if you can't get in an elevator with me, and, and if you can't do it with me right now, Mike, if you can't give me your 15-second elevator commercial why I should do business with Mastermind, then get, you got homework today. Right? <laughs> I just got my assignment. I can articulate mine very quickly and very clearly, and I do it in every conversation every opportunity I get and I always soften by saying the only reason I tell you this so you know I'm not new I'm not part-time and I can probably help you so it doesn't come across to arrogant so each and every one of you I give the listeners out there a homework assignment you come up with your 15 second elevator commercial I have mine it works nobody has to tell me whether it works or not I know it works I went from two hour presentation listing presentations to a 15 second elevator commercial and it's, and it's way more powerful because I spend the balance of the time asking questions that are relational, that are designed to help you and your family. And that's what I have to say about that. So going back to marketing and advertising, I've hired professionals around me. I've worked with Hobbs Herder Marketing and Advertising for over 25 years. Dennis LeBlanc was assigned to me one-on-one -on -one and I still work with him today. Even yesterday, I gave him a task. Uh, Elizabeth has a degree in marketing. It's wonderful to have somebody with a degree in marketing inside my firm on my team. Me, I'm a for sale by owner street kid in marketing. I've done so many different things from billboards up on I-75 to TV to radio to direct nailing 50,000 pieces at once to um, having large inside sales, ISA teams, uh, and I'm touching on everything today. I still do inside sales myself and my team players do it too. And, but the marketing, it's, it's, it's powerful positioning. It's, you know who Crest Toothpaste is. It's an easier sale for them, but you might not know Rembrandt. Maybe Rembrandt, and I don't know, maybe Rembrandt is better for the teeth, but Crest owns the position in the mind of the consumer. You do want to become that person that when you're sitting in a restaurant and people are looking you, looking at you, this happens to me, 
And they're kind of wondering, well, who is that? I've seen him somewhere. I get up out of my chair, go over and say, you're wondering who I am. I'm that realtor. Oh, yeah, you're that realtor. Boom. Right away, I'm in. I got a dialogue going. I've got a relationship going. And I make, I play it lightly, but it's relational. And, and you try to bring some humor into it. But I always leave them a card. Often I'll go in my car and get my book and bring my book back and say, hey, if you know anybody this might help, pass it on. So marketing is everywhere. To me, marketing begins with how you answer the phone. Marketing is just not in print. It's just not on TV or in social media or in a direct mail piece. It's how you answer the phone and how everybody on the team answers the phone. How you process that deal with your contract manager, how you process that listing with that listing manager, they're all a reflection of you. They're all, the public is going to determine who you are by all the people around you. And that's why I say it's critical that you hire the right people. And when and be slow to hire, be quick to let them go if they don't fit. And, you know, when you're letting them go because they don't fit, you're freeing them up to get with somebody that they fit with. And maybe they'll fit with somebody else better than you. But that's not what you were looking for. You know, maybe I was looking for a shortstop and I got a left fielder here. I need a shortstop, right? Um, so I love marketing. Marketing is powerful, but it's not as powerful if you do that in and of itself and by itself without the daily business development and high impact prospecting, their hand in glove. And I, I like to communicate that clearly, that one is better with the other. Is there a certain time of the day that you like to make those prospecting calls? Yeah, I get up and I'm, I like to get up and start at eight o'clock in the morning. And then do yeah. you have a certain number of calls you want to make or a certain time that you want to do it in? Well, throughout the day, I'm, I'm kind of mindfully being cognizant. If I'm not on appointments, I want to be business developing and prospecting. It may be, maybe, I'm, you know, I, I, in my business plan, I want to be on three listing appointments a day. Well, that's 60 a month. That's 720 listing appointments a year. If I'm on 720 listing appointments, I'm going to do some deals, right? You know, so it's figuring out how to get on those listing appointments, but they need to be on appointments that are motivated and qualified, that are ready to do something now. You know, those are the appointments I'm looking for. I'm looking at the motivation. The higher the motivation, the more real, realistic the price. The lower the motivation, the lower or the higher the price. So, you know, if you're if if it's running the driver of your business plan is listings, and it does for me. You want to figure out how do you and all your team members collectively work in such a way that, you know, maybe I want to generate a thousand listing appointments. How are we going to do that collectively as a team? What is it going to take? And, and then you break that down. And then as you break it down, you're getting into an ideal day, not just for yourself, but for all your team members. The more dollar productive your team members are, the more dollar productive you are as a team. So a dollar productive activity as a team leader for me is to get all of my team players dollar productive. Daily, consistently, business developing and prospecting. Brian, Elizabeth, they email me, just name a couple. They email me their daily accountability sheet every day. I don't think Brian's ever missed. He's been with me for 22 years. He, he it shows me how many calls he made, how many appointments he set up, how many face-to-face -face appointments that he was on, whether he was on track today or off track, and what got him off track, what does he need from me, what can I do to help him, right? Is it, is it your scripts and dialogues? Is it your, are you burnt out on doing it? You know, what is it? Do you need some motivation? Do we need to review your 10s, 25s, 50s, and 100s? That's from Dr. Fred Gross. You probably know that. Do we need to review your goals? That's what that's about. You know, so I'm going to shift back to marketing. I, I, I get off on tangents. Coming back to marketing, everything matters. Everything matters. I mean, this marketing book, I'll try to hold it up so you can see the front cover, although I scratched it just now. I don't know if you can see that. This marketing book, it's a 28-page marketing book. I, I didn't skimp on it. The graphics probably cost $30,000 just from the graphics. Then you got to pay the copywriters, right? Then you got to get with the marketing and the copywriters and the wordsmith and the, and 
figure out what's the salient point that you want to communicate. What is your unique selling proposition? Why should I hire you over any other realtor? Isn't that what everybody wants to know? The, the public wants to know what's in it for them. It need, you've got to be able to communicate it into that. That, that marketing book is my silent salesperson. I, that's what I call it. It's my silent salesperson. Doesn't whine and complain. It's day seven twenty four. Never asked for a raise. No health insurance. No benefits. And just loves to do the job. Right? It's a powerful tool. I take that. I give that out on every listing appointment. It gets me to every for sale by owner. Every expired. Anybody I talk to on the phone. If 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 you were sitting in front of me, I'd be giving you one. Probably be giving you a copy of my book now too. Those are becoming hand in glove. You're you're trying to position that everybody is a potential buyer and seller of both residential and commercial property, everybody. So you got to think about who do you want to be? How do you want to show up? You have a unique niche in what you do, Mike, in your work, in your world with Mastermind. And so you're very cognizant and aware of how you show up with your brand and your image, the quality of the product that you put out the people that you interview, you try to bring out the very best in the people that you interview for the benefit of the listeners and the viewers. That's at a high integrity level. It's the highest level. And, you know, so all of these are threaded through your marketing and advertising. You know, so each one of us need to be doing that all the time. It's we're in the marketing business. That's what I always said to myself. I am in the marketing business and I happen to do real estate. Versus. Well, this, is, this has been just really awesome. And, and, but I want to, I got to ask you a question because I know I'm eating up a lot of your time and I really appreciate it. I'm enjoying uh, this. This is fun, Mike. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. Uh, but if you were going to advise a brand new agent who's just getting in the business, what would you tell them to do first? I, there are many things that come to mind. Number one, I'd say you need to watch programs like this. Uh, the experience that I had with Bob Bowen, being a coach, a mentor that was holding my feet to the fire and holding me accountable daily, calling me every week, every week for 22 years, and seeing to it that I was going to achieve the things that I set out that I wanted to achieve. I don't even know how to thank him from that. I mean, if I think about it too much, you know, I might get a little teary-eyed. Um, but he's, he's been a magnificent contribution. So because of that relationship that I experienced with Bob, I want to pass that on. I want to coach agents. And, you know, I got a simple company. It's philhermancoaching.com if anybody has any injury. It's an easy telephone number, 937-436-9900, extension 1001. You know, but I would say you want to you want to accelerate your learning and your growth, and you can do that on Mastermind. You can do that with a great real estate coach. They're going to give you the tools that you need to be able to let things unfold. You're going to come in as a new agent. You don't have any appointments, so you're going to be focusing on one thing and one thing only: business development and prospecting, and start thinking about marketing. Just begin reading books on marketing. There's so much available on the internet, but pay attention to who you're reading to. There's real estate coaches out there that are coaching thousands of students and they've never had a real estate license. I don't subscribe to that. They don't really know what it's like to be in the trenches. Mike's been a real estate agent. He knows what it's like. He knows what he's talking about. There's those that are out there coaching that haven't, that only had a real estate license in the early 70s. We didn't even have fax machines back then, let alone iPhones and computers. I mean, you know, I don't ascribe to that. You know, Howard Brenton was a great real estate agent when he was doing it in his day. I subscribe to that. He knows what he's talking about. You want to get a coach that knows what they're talking about. That's doing it. I'm doing it every day. I mean, that's, that's the difference in me and some other coaches out there that I'm walking my talk. I'm in the trenches with you every day. I have the same problems you have every day on the inspections, on the commission, on the competition, on the competition and marketing. I mean, in my area, there's 3,000 agents. My 300 would be plenty. 300 or 3,000 is way too many. You know, so, you know, but you're a new agent. You want to, if you don't know what to do, 
you go to somebody in your office and, and, and the manager, or whatever, and say, give me the names of the top three real estate producers in this office. And you go buy them dinner, buy them lunch, and you buy them a new Mont Blanc ink pen because whatever you get from them, it'll be returned to you tenfold, maybe a hundredfold. But there is no excuse for a new agent not to reach out. If you're not asking for help, then that's a challenge. That some people feel like asking for help is a sign of weakness. Nothing could be further from the truth. Asking for help is a sign of strength, and it's a sign of an emotional intelligence. I've worked with psychiatrists, business PhD psychologists, PhDs my whole career, over 30 years, because the more I know about myself, the more effective I'm going to be able to be with other people. So there are tools all around us. And, you know, there's plenty of agents that will help that brand new agent. We needed help. We were a brand new agent once upon a time ago. We know what it's like. And, you know, agents want to call me up and say, can I pick your brain? Yes, you can pick my brain. You know, but let me help you. I'm going to accelerate it. Here's my marketing book. Here's my book. And, you know, uh, I'll buy you lunch, and, you know, and, you know, because I, you're making me feel good. You're going to make me think about what I did to start getting my airplane off the ground. Thank you. You know, so that's what I would suggest. Phil, you wrote a book, and do you write? Did you write a book specifically to help real estate agents? And if so, what's the name of that book? Yeah, the book. I'll just hold it up to you. It's just called the Phil Herman Method. I don't know if you can see that or not. I can. Yeah, it's called the Phil Herman Method. And um, you know, I'm not saying that Mike that I have all the answers. It's just a method. It's a methodology. There's many ways to get to the top of the mountain, the north face, the south face, the east face, the west face, right? The north, south face, or the north, south, northwest face. I mean, there's many different ways to get to the top. I'm just, and I'm not really at the top. I don't see myself that way. I just see myself as a student of the game. That's all I've ever been as a student of the game of real estate. I haven't arrived. I'm still trying to figure it out like everybody else. This book was written to real estate agents to say, Number one, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. It's going to happen. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. Number two, you don't need to do this alone. You don't need to be the Lone Ranger. You don't need to be doing this alone. And number three, I'm raising my hand and saying, you know, I'd love to be your coach. And, you know, no one's won a gold medal in the Olympics without having a coach. The overwhelming majority of the time, by far and away, without a doubt, is the athletes are better than the coaches. But the coaches are able to hold their feet to the fire and hold them accountable to get the very best performance out of that athlete to win that gold medal. It's a tool. It's a powerful tool. Mastermind, what you're doing here, powerful tool. Hiring a coach, powerful tool. Put these tools in your toolbox. Give yourself lift. You'll have, you will enjoy life. You, you will be living a life magnificent when you're constantly involved in improving yourself. It's all about constant and never-ending improvement. That's, that's what your educational program is about. Thank Figuring you, Bill. Thank that, you. Now, if uh, somebody wants to learn more about your coaching, do you have a website that they could go to? What was the, the website that they could go to? They could go to philhermancoaching.com. That's nice and easy. Yeah, Yeah, it's easy. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Phil, this has just been such a a pleasure today to talk with you. Now, I've gotten to the end of my questions for today. Do you have any parting thoughts for the listeners? I, I guess what I would say is that, you know, my greatest strength, I think, is that I'm competitive. And I think my biggest weakness is that I'm fundamentally basically lazy in areas that I don't have a lot of interest or enthusiasm or passion for. And, you know, so as you continue to build your businesses, whether you're new or whether you're in the middle or whether you're, you know, considered a top agent, you know, you got to always be thinking about, you know, what gives life meaning for you. And, um, and it's not always about money. Sometimes it's about relationships. Sometimes it's about holding your beloved to the level that she deserves to be held, that you're connecting with your children, and that you're building great relationships with the people that are around you. Uh, my office is my home away from home. 
that that is that's my second family. I mean, I spend more time with Brian than I do with my brothers. So that's my brother away from home. You know, so you know, enjoy yourself. Create a magnificent life. You can do, be, and have whatever you want. Phil, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for joining us on Real Estate Agent Success Calls. Keep moving forward. Bye. If you like the show and want to know when the next one's coming out, click the subscribe button. And if you want to hear more episodes like this, give the show a five-star review and write a quick comment. I read them all, and it motivates me to keep going and share the top agent success stories with you. Thanks. If you're looking for more ways to generate leads, check out our sponsor, Real GTV, real estate agent lead generation television, and their giant database library of video trainings where top agents reveal, demonstrate, and discuss their best lead generation methods. Visit RealGTV, R-E-A-L-G dot TV. If you're low on funds or just want to get the maximum leverage, check out my masterclass webinar titled Top 5 Free Lead Sources for Real Estate Agents. Learn more at FreeLeadTime.com. That's FreeLeadTime.com. Oh, and if you have a real estate friend who needs some inspiration, tell them about the Success Calls podcast. And don't you forget to subscribe right now to hear all the great top agent ideas. Keep moving forward. You've been listening to Success Calls on the Mastermind Agent Network, where top real estate agents from across North America reveal their success secrets, strategies, and systems in up-close and personal interviews. You can find all the calls at www.mastermindagent.com.